One of them is going to be about hunting the server reception, where I'm going to take a step back, talk about how, how this idea came by, why server reception, what's the difference, how do you use it, and show a couple of cases of actually hunting with it. I'm not really going to talk about the product much. That's not the point behind this. And then the second one is going to be more strategic talk, where we're going to go through a lot of APTs and talk about them, but more about their offset and evolution and how APT thread actors are operating today as opposed to... It's all right, it's me. Oh, okay. As opposed to uh, a year ago even and how that evolution works. <coughs> and on that note, something here is not working. There you go. I'll just get started. So let's start with the, I, I don't like to throw buzzwords out there, and the buzzword I want to throw out there is essentially asymmetry. There is an asymmetry in, I'm going to use the word cyber security. So what is that asymmetry? Let's break it down. First of all, uh, these are just a few pieces that I chose to demonstrate. There are many, many things we can talk about. The attackers are, are dynamic. We've seen that many, many times. They can maneuver. They can choose where they go, how they go, pivot around. We're stuck. We create offenses, we put them out there. The doctors can download them, buy them, and bypass them. Not technologically, but much of the stuff we have out there is essentially an antivirus. You download it, you play around with your binary until you bypass the defenses. And that's very, a very powerful tool that they have in their hands. The second is kind of a basic truth in security. They only need to be right once. Whether they're looking for vulnerabilities, whether they're trying to break in, they need to be right, be right once. We have to be right every single time. Everywhere. Hence the birth of management and risk management of where do we defend that's more important to us, which as security people sounds kind of ridiculous. We need to defend everything. But that's the birth of it. The defensive solutions are very bypassable which is an extension of what we first talked about. Oh, you don't have to put it that way. When you think about it, for example, you know what, I'll get into it with the slides a little bit. Let's just keep moving here. So, everybody heard this before. The attacker only needs one success at one point in time to, in, in, to gain access, right? When you have to protect everything all the time. What if we could take that basic of security and flip it around? What if we could make it but if the attacker made one mistake, they would be done. That would be pretty amazing, right? Now, this is bringing us to start thinking about economics. Start thinking about that cost from a different perspective. When you launch, for example, an intelligence operation, an attack operation, there are many things you need to do. You need to collect intelligence, you create scenarios and responses to these scenarios, but eventually you need to go and attack. Now imagine that every single asset you go to, a machine, a file, a network, could be not real. Why would that matter to you? Help me out here. Let's make it a little bit of a conversation. Why, why would it matter to you if you connect to something and it's not real? I'd start scripting it so that I can try to tell the difference between real stuff. You could. You could try to, to, to fingerprint it and yeah. say, like, is this real or not? But say you couldn't. Why would it matter to you if this is real or not? Why would you take the effort of trying to fingerprint it? Why wouldn't you just say, I don't care? <coughs> I mean, what are you trying to get? Are you trying to get botnet members to try to leak data? You're not going to leak any data off something. I'm you're right. But I'm talking about even earlier in the process. You have your tool sets. You have your vulnerabilities. All these things cost you a lot of money or effort and time. So for example, if you look at Stuxnet, Stuxnet, the coding engine, that was 12 years old. 12 years of code, of code. So for me, that means I run operations of, let's say, up to 2,500 attacks a year for 12 years, and then in one operation, I connect to the wrong machine, somebody sees my code, and it's in every other part of the world. All my old operations are now dead. All the intelligence derived from that is now no longer useful. All the operations relying on that intelligence are no longer useful. And, as we've seen with APT1, when they were disclosed, a year and a half went by, until they got the infrastructure back. 
So the costs to get all your operations back up after you lose your tool sets are insane. We'll see in the second talk I'm going to go into how the um, threat actors are starting to evolve around it, meaning maybe we shouldn't use our tool set immediately. Maybe we should create, use an interpreter or something, and then second stage, when we are sure that we can get persistence, use the real tools. You have to protect your assets. So imagine you connected the wrong thing right now and you lost your tool set. That cost could be insane. That's an economic thing that makes it very hard for them in the particular case, which means you have to start shifting around your basic behavior. For example, if you want to spread around the lateral movement, connect from computer to computer, and get to your target, you can't just go around connecting to every share, every credential. You can't just be careless anymore. You have to spend a lot of time, a lot of resources. Every operation becomes sort of an A-team operation. You sit quietly, sniff the network for three months, your costs go up exponentially, and I don't care who you are, it could be the NSA. There is a limit to how many operations you can actually run. So it all comes down to cost. Then the main question, when I want to get really into the presentation, going back to cyber deception, is why would an attacker ever go there? We talked about high costs, and we can deploy hundreds or thousands of them, but why would an attacker ever go there? So if we look at honeypots, low interaction, medium interaction, whatever, they're very fingerprintable. Meaning, I can just try to connect, try to play around with them, and I'll be able to tell, that's not a real service. I'm getting weird responses, weird response times, things are not actually happening. You can print them, print them, say, that's not real, and move on. But more important than that for me, other than the net not scaling and medium and low personnel to make them run, is, as James said earlier, they have not evolved in the past 10, 15 years, since the early 2000s. More important to me is why would an attacker actually go there? So if you try to get bots, right, you mentioned bots earlier, then they'll connect randomly on the network. If we try to con uh, catch a more sophisticated attacker, that attacker will be very careful about how they spread through the network. So for example, they'll go to my endpoint and go from there, right? So methodologically, a research tool is not scalable, and that's what the honeypot is. Deployment usually was outside the network, meaning let's try to get, uh, catch SSH brute forcing attacks, let's try to see who is pinging us and trying to footprint us, just catch automated attacks. When you start thinking about putting it into the real network, then you start thinking about, can this honeypot tell me more than just a network connection or an IOC? Can it tell me more than IP address? So let's say, going back to the high interaction honeypots James talked about, let's create a real operating system with a real service. It's completely a real machine. And let's instrument it up the wazoo so anything that runs on it, yeah, you can get the full forensics on. In fact, if anything runs on it which is not yours, nothing should ever run on it, you know it's an attacker. So what do you have? You have a real alert. This is a real attacker. You don't have a false positive. You might not catch everything on the network, but if something runs code on that machine, you know for a fact that is an attacker. You have the memory dump. You have the network traffic. You have the actual binary code. You have the shell code. You have everything. But why would an attacker ever go there? There is no reason for that. So, where the attacker actually is, the playground, is on the endpoint. If you look at 10 years, I guess it's not 10 years yet, from the Aurora incident forward in 2008, every single APT report, many, many investigations, I'm sure there have been one that worked differently, the attacker eventually gets one foothold on one machine, usually the endpoint. Whether they're done spear phishing, whether they connected to your laptop while you were at uh, a cafe, internet cafe, whatever it is, they eventually gain that one access. So, what if we could avoid installing a lot of agents on your systems, but still be able to see what's going on in the system, gain visibility? So, going through how the attacker works, this is just a comment. <laughs> you compromise the endpoint, you ask all of the privileges, you do reconnaissance, you run minicats, you net use, whatever it is, and then you proceed to do lateral movement, connecting to these various services you, you discover. So that is exactly the attack scenario we're looking for, right? The attacker accesses the network, one on the compromised, they install the privileges, they run minicats, so they use whatever cookies, whatever they can see on where to go to next. The persistent path of the user. The user usually goes there, which means this is not an anomaly. That's exactly what they're trying to do, the persistent path. 
and they, they repeat again and again and again until they find the target to hold their data. Essentially, when they get access to your network, this is their situation. They don't really know what's going on. There is a fog of war, in a way. And the, what the critical point here, when they collect intelligence, they collect our information. We control the information. They make decisions by it. Now, what if we could do something with that? So anybody here heard of the OODA loop? So the OODA loop is originally from an Air Force colonel called Boyd in the 70s. He has a whole strategic concept, theory thing that's really complex, and at one time he just decided, let's simplify it into the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. It's actually not, not a loop. You can't actually draw it that way, but it's cuter when it's a circle. So forgive me. So what we do today mostly is there is some action and as a, resulting, as a result of that trigger, we intervene with our own action and investigate. What if we could push through that all the way back to when the attacker starts? They observe us. They orient according to our information all the way to action. And that is exactly the breadcrumb we were talking about earlier. It's exactly what I was trying to describe here with the endpoint. Methodologically, if you've seen the movie, I never mention it, but let's just go for it, Inception. We incept them with our own ideas. So essentially, there is the post infection recon, and once they try to propagate, they use our own information. And that is the coolest part about this, because if they use our own information, they would reach our decoys. So very simply, something, let's go through a specific case. Spirit phishing, infecting the computer, they exhaust the computer and the information they can get from it, decide whether they want to continue or not. They look for the persistent path. And that's where they, the, where they find the credentials and the shares and all the other information, the cookies that they can use to propagate. That is also where they find the breadcrumbs. These pieces of data we left behind. So what happens immediately? Number one, if they follow through, and mostly today they follow through, they just propagate, they just enumerate through them, we'll get them because they connect to our decoys, run their code, and we know, hey, there's an attacker, here's where they came from, at least for two places. Here's an IP address and a credential they stole. Here is their code, the payload they actually used. And more than that, that's actually some creating signature so we can mitigate or look for them everywhere in the network. But more importantly, if they know that we are there, which is a policy decision really for you guys, they can no longer rely on lower hanging fruit. In a way, the entire burden of anomaly detection, the burden, burden of figuring out what's real and what's not is now their problem. They need to deal with noise. They need to deal with alert fatigue, which I find philosophically to be insane. Really, really cool. So essentially a breadcrumb, as we said, is, the, I'm gonna go into this because you guys asked, is the basic piece of data on the endpoint, and that's it. And the attacker comes along, they look for the data, they follow through, and they reach the decoy. The decoy is a virtual machine running a real operating system and a real service. Anything runs on it, it's game over. So what, what can you see? You can see, for example, scene packets, actual live sessions. You can see the payload, the code execution that they have. You can get various types of level of information up to very, very high fidelity alerts. In essence, this is the system, or any really modern reception system that you can find. The breadcrumbs are the beginning because essentially every machine in your network is now a decoy without ever installing anything on it. You use your own provisioning system, whether you pop that chef, the you know, WMI, through the domain, whatever it is, you just leave data behind and your entire network is now a decoy, effectively, which is very, very powerful. We would like to, I would like to go into a second stage here and say, these are just elements. These are just, I guess, devices and pieces of data. When we talk about deception, we talk about strategy. We talk in what we like to call stories, or as we call it in the system itself, campaigns. So we start thinking instead of VLANs and IP addresses, rather we start thinking about business units, business processes, a specific attacker that we want to tackle, tackle an attack like past the hash, whatever it is, we start thinking about 
how can we create a campaign that will specifically catch them? So a couple of examples are a database. If I'm breaking into a network and I expect to get a certain database, what would I expect to see next? What's the scene in the movie in the attacker that I would expect to see? For example, maybe PHP my admin cookies? Would I expect to see an administrator computer somewhere? What is the story that I would expect to see? I'm just thinking about the breadcrumbs and the decoys. I spread them around, I create them on the dashboard, and I'm done in two minutes and I have a new story. That said, it can go to a very complex level. For example, let's say the organization has a pain with supply chain. Supply chain is a huge issue we can't really do anything with. We can send questionnaires, we can do audits if we really want to spend money on this, but essentially we have zero visibility. So for example, let's say we talk specifically about a third party, let's say a vendor, and they connect to an internal website. Great, let's leave another cookie behind. Meaning if somebody breaks to that vendor, goes to the computer that connects to us, takes a cookie that leads to our service and uses it, they connect to our decoy, we have visibility that they've been owned and trying to hack us, and more than that, we might already have their toolset. So the entire idea of thinking in stories changes drastically the concept of how we deploy this thing. And this is something we learned from our customers. We were still thinking in a way about, we had an inkling of campaigns and stories, we started that way, but the ways that customers use this, and especially the, the free version, the community edition that's released online, it completely changed the way we think about things. So it's bringing strategy. In a way, everything I described so far as strategy, as a name in the military, and that's essentially counterintelligence. Control the information your opponent has about you. So you control their action to the level you can. And that changes everything. Recently, if you're interested in seeing a live example of that, we released uh, a live IT report called Patchwork. Don't you love the graphics? I think this is the best graphics ever. I'm just excited about it. So we released this just before Black Hat. And you can f watch through um, how we went through the investigation and how the attacker came in, exhausted the machine, decided to looking for the breadcrumbs, followed through to the cloud, connected, we got their second stage tool set. Really cool stuff. So with that, let's see how it actually worked. Let's try, see how hunting this thing down worked. First of all, very basic spear phishing. Some of the spear phishing was about the South China Sea, some of it was about nude girls. It was all over the place when you look at this. But mostly they concentrated on issues around the South China Sea. And they mostly used the Sunworm exploit in 2014, which is surprising to me that it still works so much. They gained, in six months of operations, um, 2,500 successful targets that they owned, and that was insane. And we'll talk about their intelligence operation a little bit more later. So, their staging payload was very, very simple. It was just an auto script with some um, um, default UAC bypass thing you can find on GitHub. Um, they, they essentially stole a whole lot of their code from online forums and from GitHub. Nearly the entire Trojan force was open sourced in a way, which was completely insane. The technical ability was so low that when you looked at their command and control server, it was open HTTP. Not even protected by a password. Truly insane. And think about it, this level of technology is so low, anybody could do it. It's probably buggy as hell and yet they broke into 2,500 highly protected targets. Blows, blows your mind, right? It explodes your brain. So we, we just copy-pasted this picture we saw on Facebook. I love Facebook because you already understand. And that essentially sums up their technical capability. So they have a PowerShell, very quickly, they have a PowerShell they download, um, so a PowerSplot interpreter, right, for a reverse shell. Nothing too complicated. That's very specifically documents trying to determine how the value of the system. And then if they determine it's valuable, they would download a second stage malware or continue connecting to other systems and then download the second stage malware. 
Um, we just drew it out nicely, but we can, if, unless you want to look at this graph, we can just skip it. It's graph will just said. Our goal was to secure um, the lateral movement data, the TTPs, as well as the second stage tool set. Because just an interpreter doesn't really help us, you know, we can download it. We want to actually see what they do and kick their asses. So, building a campaign, we generated the target laptop. This was essentially an investigation. And that laptop had a lot of data on it so it looks real, as well as real personality and an online persona for that personality. So it looked exactly like a government target that was our customer in Europe. Um, then fully automated using our system, we essentially created a network around it and left uh, the breadcrumbs we discussed on the system. So specifically SMB shares and RDP credentials. So far so good. And let me ask you guys just a quick question. Has anybody here ever opened the Windows Credential Manager? Okay, have you ever opened it more than once? No. No. <laughs> Why did you open it? Uh, there's a stuff stored in there for like Office 365 credentials. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information stored in there. Open it at least once, don't you? Okay. So you open it at least once and it's one guy in the room, right, who is the power user. That's his job. Would any user out there open proudly the credential manager for Windows? Would any user surf to a website by looking at the cookies in the browser preferences? Meaning breadcrumbs, this is really critical when you leave them on the system, must not be apparent to the user. They must not create friction with the user so you get support calls or anything like that. And that's possible because essentially the attacker operates on the API level. Well, the defender, sorry, well, while the user operates in the GUI level. So keeping that apart helps you to really uh, think about what breadcrumbs do I want to deploy, which becomes very, very easy. As opposed to thinking, well, will, will my user see that? I worry about that. This is what the campaign actually looked like. It's a little bit more complex than our usual examples. And as you can see, there are many services running. There are various. There are two types of breadcrumbs only that we chose, which I showed you earlier: the RDP and the SMB. And we are running one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decoys. Nothing else. So it was relatively compact. So essentially, what happened is that we have a computer, and we have the attacker. The attacker gets on the laptop, and then exhausts it, connects to the actual cloud services connects through the network services to figure out what they want to do, and it's game over. And it looks a part of a regular network, but not so much. And now I'll stop here because I don't want to talk forever, but you can just download a PDF. As well on GitHub, we put all the IOCs in both CSV and six formats. So you can just download them and import them very quickly if you're interested in the Intuit Act. Um, so feel free to just Google Petrock APT or go to our site and download the report. I think it's pretty cool to show, uh, not specifically to create another APT report, but rather how the second stage model was used, how deception was used. I find it extremely cool. I want to use another, just another use case very quickly to go through and show you some hunting from a different perspective. We had a deployment together with incident response. Usually we deploy and there is nothing going on. In this particular case, we're at uh, an aerospace, and they already knew that an APT3, uh, or Gothic Panda, or whatever name you want to use for it, installed uh, or infected their systems, and they wanted to catch it. So we deployed alongside. The idea is, if the attacker suddenly sees a new exchange server popping up, or they see a new interesting administrator account, whatever it is, popping up, they'll say, hey, that's interesting. Let's look at what it is, and then we can grab their code and figure out where they are. That did not happen in this particular case. It was the theory. So what we did is essentially deploy the searching campaign alongside the incident response. Some breadcrumbs on the actual infected compromise system that we already found that belong to the attacker to figure out if they try to exhaust the information again, run new cats, whatever it is, that will follow the new breadcrumbs. We deployed decoys of interest just 
or decoys without anything, which usually doesn't really work, and campaigns connecting the two with various stories of assets the organization had, a new business unit just created, stuff like that. And then they did not really trust their own cert, the organization, after they finished, they brought in, I think it was CrowdStrike, but I don't remember, they also did a very good job. And they cut the systems, and this is responsible over, they did remediation, and you could move on. Thing is, a month later they came back from an area of the network that wasn't covered by IT, and we caught them on the rebound. So again, the, the way that you use the section for various types of cases, whether it's a specific pain like a supply chain, a specific asset like a database, insert response, post breach, the ideas, the minute you start thinking about strategy, the minute you start thinking about processes, is completely different. So the actual servers, the actual um, services are real. The target can't really fingerprint it. They can download the tool and say, hey, you know, that looks like they're going to deploy a Windows server. Great, how much help is that going to be? Right? But the actual business process is what's failing. And that just switches the entire thought process around. With that, let's talk about tools. So we already went deeply into ADHD earlier. Uh, John Stratton is a good friend and he's a good guy. And he has essentially created a distribution, just like all Linux for pen testers. The ADHD distribution would be just download and get a whole lot of honeypots and try them out and use them. I think recommended really good stuff. And also, we come from the community. We believe in the community. We believe in giving back. And we released our own system for free. Now, we were usually about two versions behind, which means about four months behind on what we actually do. So for example, right now, let's talk about differences. This system does not have Windows because of licensing issues. It only has Linux. Uh, it doesn't have the API yet. It will. It doesn't have a lot of the automation to automatically deploy breadcrumbs across the organization using whatever system, uh, Tanium, WMI, whatever it is you want to use. So it's all manual. But you can still use it to deploy any deception campaign you like, as many breadcrumbs, as many decoys, whatever it is you want. Um, if you use it for commercial purposes, then we ask that after 30 days, you limit yourself to one decoy and 10 breadcrumbs. But all the functionality, other than the automation and the API and all that other stuff is already in there, and we update it as we go forward and develop more stuff as we proceed. And you know what the most, most important cool stuff about the section is? It works. So yeah, Patchwork was pretty cool, but we already caught through four different APTs. One, I'm not sure we should really mention, but I put it up there anyway, which is Rocket Kitten. We worked on it together with CrowdStrike, it was an Iranian APT, but we caught it before we actually had the product. So, kind of the methodology, but different. <laughs> APT3 we caught twice. It's China again, and Patchwork, which we believe is India, but nobody can ever be sure about contribution, right? And with that, thank you very much. I would love to take your questions. And then we do a break and then we come back and talk about the strategies and evolution of actual threat actors. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if if you want to see the link again, there you go, symmetria.com. And you can just go and download it. I think the direct link is community.symmetria.com. From my perspective, 
Yes, some vulnerabilities like the LNK vulnerability in Stuxnet are extremely expensive. I mean, a vulnerability that works from Windows 95 to Windows, I guess, 8 or 7 is pretty insane. And that would cost a shit ton, forgive my language. But most vulnerabilities now out there, there are many of them all the time. And attackers don't really care as much, don't get, don't, I mean, of course they do, but they don't care as much about burning zero days as they used to. What they do care about is their malware, their tool set. And for me, when an attacker breaks into a system, before they use their ODA, they'll say, hey, here's a credential right here, let's just use it. And that makes much more sense than for them to take the risk of losing their ODA if they care about it or not. As to the actual, your first point, I want to make sure I answer that. You don't know what an attacker is going to use. You can, if you already know, for example, about Fetchwork or about APT3 or whatever it is, you can use campaigns built specifically for them. And it's very easy for you to do. But if you don't, then the, you essentially start thinking about your business processes, your assets, and try to protect them. So at a very basic level, when you deploy deception, any type of deception that uses the breadcrumbs, lateral movement now becomes extremely costly. And that is the immediate value you get. If you had, for example, Sandboxing, and you had, a, you had an EDR endpoint solution or whatever it is, and you should be still data breaching all the time, now lateral movement becomes very, very costly to them and very dangerous. That's the basic of it. Then there is a maturity model, as I would like to call it. You start creating these various campaigns. They're going to go after your databases. They're going to go after your CELA. They're going to go after the payment system, whatever it is. And you just start creating these campaigns, which is very quick, and over time you get better at it. And the idea is you don't really care about if they use an ODA or don't use an ODA. You just want to catch them. It's about, in a way, the shift is not just economic. The shift is that attacks change all the time, vulnerabilities, malware change all the time. What doesn't change is the decision-making process, the methodology, the psychology of the attack. And because, if we go all the way to the beginning, They don't really know where they are, they're vulnerable. And I want to exploit that vulnerability. Yeah. So it's not a full answer, but it's as full as I can make it. Other questions? No? Cool. Other questions? No? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in that case, let's go on a break and then talk about the redactors. Thank you very much for listening.